this uh, lecture is about bimodal experiments and um, until now we have more or less just talked about a single um, modality that's neutron imaging or maybe we talked about x-rays as a comparison um, there are a lot of books that you can read on this topic i just want to give you a little list um, that's in general just image processing but there is there are a couple of books about data fusion image fusion and uh, image registration which are techniques that are very helpful in um, when you work with more than one imaging modality so this is the outline of this lecture first a little bit motivation we have some scientific goals what we want to achieve then i switch over to image fusion and bivariate segmentation and that is the end of it so we have our imaging modalities uh, with neutron imaging uh, we do a lot of different experiments um, so typically what we are doing is hydrology and soil and geology cultural heritage uh, metal pieces combined with organic material uh, also building materials and we also go into material science and usually you have some challenge experimental challenging um, with the image acquisition in these different um, experiments so it could be that it's hard to do the right segmentation it can also be hard to estimate the water content um, soil has some soil has the um, um, characteristic that it uh, is swelling when water is coming in and going out um, so i think actually the soil uh, in Skåne is has a pretty high clay content is, is that right um, so that is a soil that produces a lot of cracks and um, is swelling and well it's not easy to work with when you're doing an image experiment where you want to have all the solid material on the same spot so and, and then if, if it's all of a sudden it's moving you don't know anymore where you have uh, what is water or what is structural change so that is a problem when you start doing the segmentation also um, and um, well you can have a lot of ambiguous readings for example depending on the um, energy neutron energy it can be hard to distinguish between iron and copper uh, in at thermal energies no doubt but in more a more cold spectrum all of a sudden they have almost the same attenuation coefficient and then you don't know really what is what so um, what we want to do then is to select the right modality to see what we want to see so some things to select a uh, specific modality is you have good transmission have good contrast of the, what you want to see all the relevant things are visible and the materials that are distributed can be well identified of course on the negative side you you can't go come through the sample uh, at icon for example more than five millimeters of water it's black uh, you can also have low contrast so you don't really see what you want to see uh, also that in some cases the features you want to see they're not visible and um, also ambiguous responses that you don't really know what what it is you're seeing and um, if we only use a single modality, this can be a problem. So what we want to do is to add on a second modality and uh, or several modalities, if you would like. And the idea is to be able to extend the range of operations so to better cover what you can want to see. Uh, you may also want to extend the spatial and temporal coverage. So on with one modality, you may be able to get 10 times higher resolution and that can help you to identify the structures and then afterwards you let the second modality um, do whatever it does but it delivers the, the functional information um, so then you can limit it in within the, the boundaries of of the given by the first modality so with that you re reduce the uncertainty in your measurements and you also in of course then increase the reliability and also get the more robust system performance of the whole measurement um, and um, in an imaging experiment that's essentially already mentioned i believe in previous lectures you have four different components that you are working with 
Um, one thing is you have the top ball in this um, pyramid as the application. That is the starting point for the experiment. You need to have an application. And that application is based on some kind of physics. The physics is on one side, what is happening within your uh, sample or your process, but also how this interacts with the beam you're working with. Then you have the acquisition, which is essentially a sampling system. And uh, the question is how fast you can sample, at what resolutions you can sample, and um, to get the data into the computer. And finally, you have the last step, which is the processing, because once you got data in your box, you have data, you have bits, bytes, but you can't really interpret it. So that is in a processing step where you start doing image analysis uh, to uh, get quantity, hopefully quantitative information out of the data. Uh, some modalities that we in the neutron imaging uh, community are talking about is the combination of neutrons and X-rays. X-rays, of course, well known. You see them everywhere in the hospital, in, in different lab sources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, sometimes as synchrotron. Uh, neutrons are more rare, as you already have heard, but um, that's another modality. And you can see here from this periodic table, which I actually showed yesterday too, uh, that the um, attenuation coefficients of neutrons and X-ray, they look very differently. And in some cases, they are even complementary. So you can see here the hydrogen, uh, which is uh, very dark um, with neutrons, is very bright with, uh, with X-rays. And uh, many of the metals down here, they, um, they are completely black uh, with the X-rays, but you can see through several of them pretty easily with, um, with the neutrons. And combining this, you can actually get a better picture of what you're seeing. Uh, so um, one example would be that you look at um, a metallic implant in bones. Then you can see um, with X-rays, you get horrible uh, metal artifacts because the metal is attenuating the X-rays so hard that you get artifacts out of the reconstructed data. While for neutrons, okay, the bone itself may be pretty wet. Uh, that is a problem, but the, the screw can be almost transparent depending on what, it's, what alloy it's made of. We had different types of screws. Some gave a good contrast, other ones didn't. So um, that makes it possible to go much closer to, to the screw. Um, and with, with the X-rays, you may get a very nice picture of the screw itself. While with the neutrons, you can get how the bone structures are growing onto the screw. Um, in medical imaging, it's also pretty popular to combine different modalities. And uh, we are talking about MRI, uh, X-rays, uh, PET, SPECT, and so on. And then you can get a combination of structures which you get from the X-rays mainly, uh, but also you can get functional imaging, how the flow of uh, different uh, signal substances are in, in this case, it's a brain, but you can also see how, how well, how well the, the flow is in, in a knee joint, for example. And with that, you can then get more function, but you can also see in these images that PET and SPECT, they are pretty low resolving data. But if you then combine and overlay them, then you see that you can really nicely identify the boundaries wherein you have these um, different functions. Uh, another one, uh, which is actually using the same kind of beam, but you add more information is using grating interferometry. And with that, you don't only get the um, normal transmission image, which you know, but you can also get differential phase contrast and you can get a dark field contrast. And you can, uh, and they show different physical uh, properties of the sample. So if you combine all these three, you could probably also learn a little bit more about the sample. Um, the question is what you want to learn and how you motivate yes, setting up your fusing rules, but um, you could use this as a combination. 
Another one is, um, I think you probably heard about this already, but uh, looking at uh, different energies or wavelengths of the neutrons, and then you can get Bragg-Edge spectra. This is not really uh, multimodal in that sen sense, but you have very much data about the same sample under different conditions, so uh, different beam conditions. And that can also be used in order to do better segmentation. Uh, so uh, looking at, um, for example, the um, uh, segmentation where you can find that in one region you have some uh, texture and in another region you have a different texture. You don't see these differences in the transmission image, but if you combine all these energies, then you can extract more information. So um, by taking, say, 100 uh, wavelength bins, putting them together with some nice fusion role, rule, uh, then you can get new information about where you have different regions and which you want to drill down into and look into more in detail. Uh, then, uh, now, until now, I've only been talking about data from about the same uh, dimension. Uh, so you look at 2D or 3Ds together, but it could also be single point measurements. It could be temperature um, or temperature fields. If you have um, a camera that can re register temperature variations, it could be fluorescence information that you look at. Um, or you can have, if you do a speedy experiment, you may do a tomography in the beginning of the experiment and maybe one in the end. And in between, you do a lot of radiographs. And how do you fuse this information together? And with that, you can then add information like temperature, flow rates, or pressures within um, the system. So with that, you can also do some fusion. Um, how you do it? Well, that is a good question. But uh, you probably have a good idea if you're setting up an experiment where you want to look at this then you should also know a little bit about how you should combine the, this data. The next thing you need to do once you've got the data from these uh, modalities is to fuse uh, the data. So in principle is data fusion or image fusion is um, a theory or set of tools and techniques that you use to combine data from different sources uh, to provide a common uh, format with, that you can have more information about. So the aim is actually to improve the information quality of the images by doing this kind of fusion. And hopefully, the information you get out of the fusion is more than 1 plus 1 equal 2, but it should maybe be 2.5. So you get, actually, you learn more about the sample thanks to the combination of two uh, different modalities. Um, fusion approaches. Well, in the beginning when I started, there was always uh, the question, yeah, do you have, have the solution now how to do the data fusion? There is no solution. There is no golden recipe that solves all your fusion. There are very many different strategies to work with. So you can do a kind of what I have call here a multivariate fusion, where each data set is combined on the same level. So you're just more or less uh, yeah, whatever, multiplying, weighting them together, um, using the same concept. Um, and then there's augmented fusion, where you use uh, one, for example, to do structural segmentation, and the other one to see what is going on within the sample, and then you combine them. Um, there are also approaches to do artifact reduction, as I mentioned with this uh, screw in, in bones. Uh, we had these artifacts from, from the screw in, um, with the X-ray images, and with the help of the neutron images, you can see that, okay, this region shouldn't have all these stupid streaks. It should be pretty homogeneous. And then you can combine data from the neutrons to help the X-ray reconstruction and combine maybe also um, data from the X-rays into the neutrons. And in the end, the goal is to get a nicer reconstruction without saying cheating, because you're filling in the blanks kind of. 
using the other modality. Um, and then, of course, if you can do one, why not combine them and do two, three together and gain the most information in the end? And uh, exactly which strategy you're using, it depends on uh, if you're using uh, on, on the sample composition, what are the objectives of your experiment in the first place, what do you want to see? And also, to some extent, it depends on the condition of the data. Do you have a combination of low signal to noise ratio and uh, bad resolution on one side and high resolution on the other side, then you have to maybe choose a different approach than if you would have great, fantastic images on both sides. So it's the choices, how you combine the data comes up to the data you have in the end and what you are looking at. So it's not, not obvious directly. And there are different levels of fusion. So you can do the fusion uh, having data in and getting the same kind of data out with a little bit more enhancement um, or segmentation or something. And it can do also be that you do the fusion that you have a lot of data coming in and out comes say, nice features. So you can have like there you have, um, you have say, different bones or different structures that you identify with the help of the two sources. Then you can go one step higher, then you do a lot of analysis on the images, reduce each image to some features, and then you combine those features into some fusion rule. And um, then get, getting even more abstract, then you have features in the images, and those result in decisions based on what you have in the two, um, two modalities. And finally, of course, you have um, decisions versus decisions. And if you're talking machine learning, that would be um, something similar to a random forest. Um, in uh, machine learning, there's a technique called random tree, which does a lot of uh, decisions based on essentially decision making and um, going through a decision tree. Um, and each of these trees produce some result, and the results of those are weighted together to get the best uh, choice. So that would be a decision, decision uh, choice. Uh, more graphically, you can also look at the, the workflow like this, where you have uh, first the image acquisition, images coming in, they may not even be in the same shape. And the first step is to do a registration, uh, which I'll mention on the next slide. Then you do pixel-wise fusion, so really pixel to pixel, uh, you may need to do some alignment and calibration to get the images on the same scale. Otherwise, there will be maybe uh, some saturations um, which you don't want to see, or you, you may be biased or skewed because of, you, of no calibration. Uh, then you can step on to the feature fusion, doing different, um, ex uh, extracting different features, and checking these features against each other if you have different properties in them. And finally, you have the decision where you do labeling of the objects and telling this object is, and the classic one uh, talking about machine learning is saying it's a dog or a cat, but I don't think we are talking about dogs or cats here, uh, but uh, maybe saying that this is, um, screw of that type, this is a screw of the other type uh, with these and these materials. Um, so that would be uh, the kind of labeling you could do with the help of the fusion. Um, from the fusion, you continue doing more uh, work. So it could be that you want to present it somehow. So you have display, you can use uh, colorful renderings or something like that. But you can also go toward uh, statistics and modeling uh, to really get the quant quantify models based on the fused data. Then there is a term called catastrophic fusion. And um, that is something that happens if you bring in data, combining it, and it performs worse than you have each individual uh, method for itself. If you get something like that, you should start 
going back to the design board and think about what you're doing and uh, redesign and get something new. But it could be caused by uh, you have a selection of the wrong variables. You have you're fusing the wrong information, or maybe you're fusing a too complex variation of different variables and maybe doing it completely wrong way. Or it could also be that the sensor information is canceling each other. So one is showing this and the other is showing that, and when you combine them, you have a zero. So um, stay away from the kitchen where you have too many chefs. That's usually not resulting in a good soup. Um, image registration, I mentioned before. And image registration is a process that you need to do when you start doing fusion. You have one image which you have fixed, say, let's say my hand here. And then you have another image which maybe have a different scale, which is rotated a little bit. Um, and then you want to fit them on the same scale. And when you start that, you see first you need to flip it. Okay. And then we can move it together until they fit perfectly over each other. So th that you have the same pixel size uh, and also the same rotation and the translation so that it really fit together. And that is an optimization uh, system where you um, try to minimize some cost function, sometimes just a mean squared error or something like that. Um, registration is done sometimes on, on the same modality. But if you have different modalities, it can be difficult for the algorithms to find uh, good metrics that actually uh, combine the two modalities together. Because in some cases, you see there is a lot of um, holes. But these holes may appear as something very bright in the other modality. So you, you have to have images with some, uh, sometimes you need to have some landmarks in the images in order to get a nice. Uh, um, registration between them. And in particular, with when you combine um, complementary uh, modalities, it is very useful to start out with a good starting point. So you already manually more or less wrote it in more or less good position. And then afterwards, you start the optimization and get the final fitting. Because this is um, optimization system with very many local minima that you can get stuck into. Uh, there are tools for doing this and there are also libraries. Um, on the open source side, there is a, a software called uh, 3D Slicer and um, that's an interactive tool, which is very helpful. It guides you through. It's based on um, a library called ITK inside toolkit, which you can also implement in the form of um, C++ code or Python scripts. And um, the thing is that ITK is not so user friendly. And some people thought, ah, well, let's do something specific for registration. So um, they implemented um, a um, toolbox based on ITK called Elastics or simple Elastics. And that one is a popular one to work with when you do registration. And this is really important first step to get your data in the right grid. Otherwise you can't do any comparison at all. And um, well, I think I said a lot about this already. Uh, in this book, uh, there are a lot of metrics uh, mentioned. And uh, well, it's this book is about registration. So if you want to learn more about how registration works, this is the go-to book if you want to. Um, then once we have the registration, then we can work with, um, here is an example done by my colleague, David Mannes. It's a sword found in a lake here in Switzerland. And it was very well preserved. But the problem, uh, and the archeologists, they wanted to make a reconstruction to understand how this sword was made. So um, we started out, and I think they even started doing uh, general material analysis and came to the conclusion it contains uh, iron, of course, it's a sword. Um, there was amalgam, there was, um, which um, 
includes a lot of mercury. Mercury is bad for the x-rays. And uh, <clears throat> then there was wood, which is, well, more or less transparent for the x-rays, but uh, with neutrons, you can see it very well. Uh, and then some other metals, I think. Uh, the cap on the top was also some other metal. And it was also wood filled, it came out. <clears throat> but in the end, what they did, they used the combination of neutrons and x-rays to really combine out the amalgam dots which produce horrible uh, artifacts in, um, in the x-ray images. You could just see it, this looked like a lot of needles just streaking out from, from, the, from the grip. Um, and with the neutrons, it was pretty easy to uh, confine them into these small blobs that they actually were. And uh, we could also see nicely uh, the annual rings of the wood. And I think they tried to even date it based on these annual rings afterwards. The final story of this um, sword was that the um, experimental archaeologist even made a replicate of this very sword afterwards, based on the neutron images that were measured. Uh, the segment, oh, sorry. Uh, the segmentation on this one was done in VG Studio, which is a commercial software. Uh, so the whole work was done within VG Studio, um, which also includes registration algorithms and uh, also uh, partly automated segmentation and also uh, manual segmentation guidings. So um, if we want to do this kind of uh, registration and, uh, and visualization together, we start with some data. We have here um, a snail shell uh, done with neutrons and with x-rays. Uh, you can even see that there are some, I think there's some beam hardening within it. Um, but anyway, these are the data we want to combine. You can see that it was already registered because this rotated here. So they are on the same scale and position right now. And now we want to combine this in some different ways. Uh, one way of doing it, which is very helpful when you do the manual registration is to do a checkerboard uh, visualization. Uh, if you want to do some coding or use this code, feel free to, um, you can actually download uh, this presentation as a Jupyter notebook. So the examples that I have with code, you can actually execute yourself. And um, now we try this checkerboard um, with the images that we had. We had the neutron image, we have the X-ray image, and then we mix um, the two modalities in these checkerboard um, squares. And that's a very good way to see if you fit the data uh, well in, during the segmentation. If you have a good segmentation, you can see nicely that it's okay, perfect. It fits nicely all the way around. And you can also see the contrast differences between the two modalities. It's a quick way to get a qualitative view of uh, what you are looking at and what the two modalities can provide you. Uh, this is a, um, a tool that is available, for example, also in 3D Slicer. And um, then you can select also what's, how, how big these um, squares should be and uh, do this um, overlay together. Another way for the visualization is doing color channel uh, mixing. And what is typically done, what many are doing, is to take modality A as a red channel, modality B as a green channel, and then um, the, the blue channels in the end is just the average of the two modalities. And uh, well, you can do it like this, but who says you need to use this uh, fermentation? You can use any fermentation. So here I tried and played with different fermentations that image A got into the red, image B got into the green. Looks pretty acid-like. Uh, then we can try the next one where we look at um, uh, image B. Uh, image A goes into the blue and image B goes into the green. Yeah, I don't know if this color coding makes sense so much. Uh, this color coding where image A goes into the red and image B goes into the blue is very useful in uh, porous media examples where you have soil 
because the, this combination delivers, uh, if you have uh, neutrons on the blue and X-rays on the red, then the soil turns into brownish, which makes sense, and the water um, turns into blue. So it's a very nice uh, color combination to use for um, soil and water examples or geology examples. So in the end, we want to do something more quantitative with the data. And a first step is often that you want to do a segmentation. And segmenting the data, uh, the typical way you do it is looking at a histogram of um, the modality. Um, in this case, I have the histogram of some data with two classes, foreground and background, and they are very much overlapping. You can see that it's very hard to set a, a threshold that makes sense in this data. And uh, you will also, for that reason, have a lot of misclassifications, both uh, saying that um, void is solid and solid is void. And uh, that's not very useful. Um, then we can see here also, just to point that out, uh, we have modality A is blue and modality B is red. And um, oh, material A is blue and material B is uh, red, sorry. Uh, then we look at a second modality and you can see that that was had low intensities in modality A, has now got um, a high intensity in modality B. But still, it's the same bad uh, separability between the classes. You still have the same general histogram, so it doesn't really help us. Now, what happens if we look at the bivariate histogram is that you see that these histograms that were hard to distinguish um, between the two classes, you have a great separability if you plot them up in a bivariate histogram. So you have here on one side, you have modality A, and on this side, you have modality B. And when you plot them together, you see very nicely that they are separated. And if you would do a threshold between those two, you wouldn't have very much of misclassifications compared to before. So this is what we're aiming at. And uh, looking at the example with soil, which is my favorite, um, here you can see some roots. That are these white blobs around here, and that one, and those. And um, you can see the roots very well in the nutrient imaging. They contain water and um, organic material, so they're nicely visible. If you look at an X-ray image of, um, of the same sample, you see just a void. You don't see that there is actually a root inside. But you can see that here is a stone. But that stone is like a hole in a neutron image. So there is really a nice example how complementary these two methods is for the soil. And that makes it very useful um, if you look at soils with high clay content, for example, when you know that the soil is growing and moving around, um, then you can use this technique to really capture how the soil is moving and how the water is moving and separate them. And looking at the bivariate histogram of this data, now I use a logarithmic scale here because there are so few roots. There is a high class imbalance, it's called. And uh, it's very hard to really find it unless you use the logarithmic counts. In principle, what you will see is this peak and that peak and nothing else. Um, but anyway, here you can see this is the background. This is the soil. This is the container. And this are the roots. It's very nicely separated within in this data, even though it's relatively noisy, but we can get a separation between the different uh, classes that are present in, in this data. And how to do the segmentation of this? Well, there are some approaches just drawing regions around each one um, and use that as a segmentation map, but there are also uh, more um, numerical methods to do this. And uh, <clears throat> one way is to work with um, hypothesis testing and statistics. So you would say that you have hypothesis one is, has some distribution, hypothesis two. So that would be, for example, backgrounds, uh, soil, wall, um, 
roads, etc. Uh, what is important to do this segmentation, if you want to do this bivariate segmentation, is for the first, you have images of different modalities. They have to be registered, so you can do a pixel-to-pixel -pixel comparison. And they have to be also ideally artifact corrected. If we go back to, um, uh, let's see, this one, you can see that I didn't do a good job of correcting for the beam hardening uh, in this image. You can see it's very much brighter uh, at the boundary than in the middle. And that is always bad when you try to do segmentation by single thresholds. And uh, what we can do, the methods that we can think about is um, and a lot of different methods to work with um, multivariate data. But uh, if you go into uh, different machine learning techniques, uh, you have methods called k-means, which kind of average, uh, trying to find average, uh, the closest uh, value to some centroids, uh, case nearest neighbors, then you have to do some training before. Uh, you can also do regression methods. You can use neural networks. Uh, what I'm going to show now is uh, Gaussian mixture models, which is a method based on the statistical distributions of the gray levels. And um, first, just using a toy example, what we are talking about is we have the probability map is the sum of different uh, Gaussian distributions. You have the centroid and you have some uh, covariance matrix that describes the shape of each of these Gaussians. And there is a weight how much you have of these. So this is an example where you can see, probably you can see by the uh, directly that here is something going a little bit tilted in that direction and here is something tilted in that direction. And uh, now with the help of Gaussian mixture models, we can say that we fit one class, and of course, then it finds something that is diagonal. It doesn't really make sense. You can see it directly. Then you can do with two classes. Well, actually, it looks reasonable. Um, but then if you increase the number of classes, which you can, of course, do, but then you are doing some kind of overfitting and trying to fit in more classes that are actually present uh, within this data. So that doesn't also not make sense. So you have to do some kind of verification how much sense uh, it is to choose different uh, number of classes in, in your data. Once you have decided, OK, I want to work with two classes, then you got also the parameters. You get the centroid, and you get the covariance matrix describing the shape of this uh, Gaussian. And uh, then for the decision, you, you use something called classification distance. And um, yeah, it's a lot of ugly equations, sorry. Uh, <laughs> in principle, the Euclidean distance is more or less you just take the um, distance from the centroid of, of your distribution and the, the value combination. So the gray level combination you have um, for, the, for a pixel, you have one neutron value and you have one X-ray value. And the centroid also has the corresponding X-ray and neutron value. And you compute the distance, and you see between the classes that uh, to one, you have maybe distance, say, 10. And to the other one, you have distance 100. So the first one is the closest one. So that is my class. Then there are more advanced methods uh, where you involve also the covariance matrix of each distribution. And to make it really horrible, you can also include the local covariance of the dot uh, that you measure. And uh, what that looks graphically is that with the Euclidean distance, it's a very simple one. Then you just look at how close am I to these points, and then you select the class that is given by that. Uh, with the uh, Mahanlubis distance, then you also include a little bit more about the shape in the distribution. And then you can see that, OK, here it was not really clear. It's actually in the middle between the two of them. So you can't really tell easily. If you add the covariance matrix, you see, OK, it's within the range in, in the neighborhood of this one, not on that one. So you'll have a better choice. Uh, but the Sharia is, 
well, that's probably too complicated in most cases, but then it would be that you have two distributions that are overlapping and see which overlaps the most. But um, I would say this one is already a pretty good choice. And then I took my root histogram, got some um, distributions around each of the classes, and I computed the Euclidean decision space. And you can see that there are lines cutting, and everything in this green area is said to be a root. Everything in this blue area is said to be background. And then we have the soil and we have the container. Now, thanks to um, my beam hardening, it is unfortunately that you get some roots are actually said to be container because uh, we have, in principle, bad training data in our data set. Um, and then on the outside, also, you can see maybe, let's see if I can zoom it in a little bit. Um, let's see. No. Yeah, there you can go. So uh, you can see that there is like a skin effect on, um, on the outside. And that's a typical problem you have when you have multiple classes that you want to segment. That you are somewhere, if you have smooth edges, at some point you are between two classes and um, you are wondering between, um, you should actually go from that one to that one, but you have to pass through this area here. And uh, for that reason, you will get this uh, brownish area. Let's see if we can go back again. Yeah, something like that, I think. So um, this is <clears throat> something you have to watch out for when you do, um, multi-class um, segmentation <clears throat> and um, maybe you have to look into uh, how to handle this case uh, better and um, another way which kind of is something that would be nice is to do bivariate uh, estimation so if we go back to looking at the Lambert's law and uh, spell out what you actually have in the attenuation coefficient, you see that you have the density, you have the atomic weight, which is given for the different elements, uh, you have Avogadro's constant, and uh, you also have the microscopic cross-section, which is the radiation interaction uh, parameter. And in principle, from this, you should be able to estimate, for example, the, um, the density uh, in theory. Uh, it's not very easy to do it. I tried a couple of times, but you need very clean and safe data. But it's kind of a, a thought experiment that, in principle, it should be possible in theory, but uh, it's not easy to do in, in practice. And then when you have started doing um, a modal ex experiments or multimodal experiments, um, the next thing is you saw that I have had um, a cylinder with soil and roots. Well, when you're doing that, you usually you want to go the step next step and looking at the process, how the water is going through um, the, um, the sample. And then you go to the multimodal um, real-time experiments. So then we start combining the bimodal data, uh, the bi bimodal acquisition with also with time series acquisition. This produces a lot of data, I can guarantee you. Uh, maybe not so much data as they do on a synchrotron, but for neutron imaging purposes, a few days you can produce, easily produce a couple of terabytes of data when you're doing this. So um, what we do at ICON is that we have a setup, and this setup has then afterwards also been replicated or similar setups have been replicated at ILL and at, uh, in Grenoble and uh, um, NIST in, um, in the US. Um, so that you have one cone beam X-rayed um, beam line across the neutron beam line. And then what we have done in our, one of our experiments is actually that we start spinning the sample going up at uh, high speed. Like I think I didn't listen to Nikolai's uh, lecture, but he probably talked about that, that you go up spinning up the sample and then you start acquiring images 
at some given rate, and then afterwards you can reconstruct time series data from that. So this is what we are going uh, in the direction we are going in many force media experiments. And um, well, that was the end of my lecture. And um, in principle, what the idea is that with the help of multiple modalities, you are able to get more information or more uh, reliable information uh, from uh, about your sample. And um, you can, to get this information, you need to do some kind of, first you need to do a registration and then you have to fuse the data in some way to get to the different level of abstraction and get the quantitative information out of your experiment. And well, that was it. <laughs>